So my daughter is five, and she loves princesses and is driving me crazy, okay? So to be perfectly transparent about some bad parenting, I have been hiding all of her princess books because I don't want to read them anymore. I'm just sick of it, okay? But one of the funny little princess things she does is that before she broke it a few months ago, she had a little pink princess crown, right? And she'd run around the house with this little pink princess crown singing, I'm a princess, you know, and, and playing princess. And, you know, for us, a crown today, it's kind of like a kid's toy thing. You can get it at $1 at the dollar store or like $23 at the Disney store. Big difference, right? But, but that's what a crown is for us today. But for thousands of years, a crown was one of the most important symbols in the entire world. A crown was who had real authority and real power in your life. They get the, whoever wore the crown, they got to decide what you believed and what you did and where you lived. They, I mean, they had real authority and real power in in your life. So, so for, for most of human history, with kings and queens and, and that way of ruling things, a crown was a symbol of power and authority. Now today, in our country, we don't have powers and powers like that, right? We don't have kings and queens, and so that, that, that crown doesn't quite mean that for us. But I would argue that we each get to decide now who gets to wear our crown in life. What thing or what person or what group, what, what possession gets to wear our crown, gets to have that crown of power and authority and, and, and gets to have that, that control and that charge over our, our life. And we give it to all sorts of things. But for thousands of years, Christians have made the claim that Jesus and only Jesus gets to wear our crown. In 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 15, we read, Our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. So scripture makes this, this huge claim that Jesus is King of kings, Lord of lords, the ruler of rulers, then only Jesus should be wearing the crown in our life. That, that we should, when we have that crown, we get to give the authority and the power over our lives to something or someone that we give it over to Jesus. But in today's world, of course, we know that we end up giving that crown to all sorts of different things. And one of the things that we give that crown of authority and power in our lives over to, of course, is politics. Starting a message series right now called Politics, just to make it very clear, Politics, Following Jesus in an Age of Division. And we are not going to talk about individual subjects and views and, and vote for this person or that person. That is not the intent in any way, shape, or form. Instead, it's this. Have you noticed that politics is divisive? Right? Anybody? Maybe? Have you noticed that it's toxic to your soul? That like the more you take it in, the more it just frustrates you. Right? Have you noticed that it touches every area of life? Okay, so if something's that important, how can we not talk about how to do it in light of Jesus? Right? We can't not talk about this. I didn't just throw a dart at a board and say, what is the hardest thing we can talk about this month? Right? Like, what would be the most unfun thing? No, we have to talk about this. And one of the reasons is, is that politics is taking center stage in many people's lives, many of our lives. It's kind of hard for it not to at times. Ultimately, sometimes politics is wearing the crown. It's getting the authority and the power in our life. And by politics, I mean, when I'm saying politics, I mean a political ideology or political leaning or a political party or, 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 or something like that, right? That's what I mean by politics. And for many Christians today, really politics is wearing our crown instead of Jesus. A massive study by the Barna Group found that over half of American adults now view the political engagement of Christians as a real concern in our nation. It's like the way we're engaging in this thing right now, the way that many Christians are placing politics at the center of the crown of their life, it's concerning to other people. Other people are noticing. It's hurting our witness. We have to know this. Another study by Pew Research told us that, that basically we value politics in our nation over faith now. In interviewed adults, and, and at this point since 2010, American adults are twice as likely to marry outside of their faith as they are outside of their political party or leaning. That's crazy, right? <laughs> I mean, who you marry tells you a whole lot about what you value, and we're valuing politics over faith. Jesus is often not wearing our crown. Often we, we've taken our crown out, we've give, given it 
to a political party or all ideology or politician. Now, politics, the line between like politics and faith in our country has become really blurry, hasn't it? It's blurry. And so it's hard to know who's wearing our crown. It's hard to know who we've given the ultimate authority and power over our life. So today I want to look at six very practical signs to know if you have given the crown, the authority and power of your life, if you've given it to politics, okay? So six signs that you've given the crown of your life, the crown of your heart over to politics. First, we know we've given our crown to politics if God has not changed one of our political opinions recently. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Now, this is a very famous verse, but basically, in this context, when we're talking about politics, it's very easy to allow the political mechanisms of this world to make your mind conform to them, right? But Jesus is saying here, hey, Paul is writing here, hey, you need to actually don't conform to the ways of this world. You have to allow God to change your mind. You have to go to God's word and allow him to transform how you think and about your opinions and your views about things. Don't allow them to be static based on your conformity to the world. Let God change you. Let God transform you. And the closer you get to his will and his way of thinking of things, then you'll be able to go back and test and approve everything that's out in the world. Which means that if we cannot point to a very specific political view that we possess, that God has changed in the last few years, well then maybe, maybe politics is wearing our crown. Maybe we are, as Romans says, conforming to the ways and patterns of this world. So I grew up in Kansas in the 1990s, and uh, well, you you're all smart people. You can probably figure out what 1990s Kansans' opinions on immigration was, right? Anybody can take a guess, right? Okay. Kind of on the verge of hateful where I was, where I was growing up. And I remember that as I figured out faith for myself in college, I was reading Leviticus because I didn't know not to, that it was so painful, right? So, so I'm reading the book of Leviticus, and I come across this verse that says, love the foreigner as your own. I was like, whoa, that's really different than what I, the, uh, the mindset I grew up with. And so God began to transform that opinion in me. He began to work on my heart. Look, right now, I have opinions that contradict the ways of God. And you do too, right? And so if God, if we're not giving God the open door to come in and say, change it. Change how I think. Even about my politics, change it. Transform it then we might not be worshiping him. God wants to change you, and if he isn't, someone else is wearing your crown. We know we've given the crown of our life away to politics if we have not had one of our views changed by God recently. Second, we can know also, if we're, if we're more concerned with who we're voting for than how we treat people who are voting differently than we are. Most of you have probably heard this, the, the, this saying of Jesus from John 13, 34 to 35, love one another. I'm going to move over. This. You can see better the screen. Love one another. Anyone heard that, right? Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we probably heard this, you know, love one another, treat others with, with, with love. But in its context, there was, there was a, a slight political context to this, because here's the thing. Jesus was saying this to his 12 disciples. And if you know anything about his 12 disciples, you know that they were coming from different political contexts where they had previously hated each other's political groups. And so there was a, a group named the Zealots. And Jesus actually had, so as he says, love one another, and the 12 disciples sitting around him, one of them was a man by the name of Simon the Zealot. Now, in that day, zealot did not mean passionate. It was a political activist group that was attempting through violence to get the mechanism, the, the empire of Rome out of Israel. And so if you think the feud between Democrats and Republicans is bad, the zealots, how they would make their views known is that they would stab people in broad daylight in the street that they disagreed with. People in the political establishment of Rome. People like Matthew who had been a tax collector. 
Now, being a tax collector was a political affiliation because basically you were saying, I'm an Israelite in, in a nation that's being oppressed by Rome, invaded by Rome, and I'm going to go to the Roman establishment and say, oh, I'm actually going to be in with you guys. I'll come take money away from the Israelites, my own people. I'll steal it and give it to you and your system. I'll go steal money from the regular Jewish people, people like Peter who is just a normal poor fisherman before Jesus finds him, one of the oppressed people in Israel by this Roman establishment. And so as Jesus says, love one another, if you think of it in a political context, it would have had every argument, every excuse not to love one another. It would be very easy for Matthew as the tax collector and Simon as the zealot and Peter as a poor fisherman, all to have actually hated one another because of their previous political affiliations. But Jesus is crystal clear. He's saying all those political affiliations, they do not matter compared to how you just treat people, compared to how you love one another. Forget about that stuff and love. God is way less concerned with who you vote for than how you love the people who don't vote like you. We know we have given the crown of our life to politics if we're more concerned with who we're voting for than how we're treating the people who vote differently than us. Third, we can know that we've given our crown to politics if we're on the wrong side of the leash. So I have a dog who's a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and he's about 90 pounds, and his name is Rufio. And he fits in great to our house because he has way too much energy and he's just a hair crazy, right? And so I try to, it's hard to take him on a walk around the neighborhood because he wants to lead me. You know, he just has all this energy and all this strength. He just pulls and pulls and pulls on the leash. But what would be really funny is if you were driving through my neighborhood and you looked over and you saw me wearing the collar and like my dog carrying the leash and leading me around, right? Like that would be really funny, wouldn't it? But that's what the world is seeing in so many Christians' lives. We've got politics and faith on the wrong side of the leash. Our faith is supposed to inform our political views. Our faith is supposed to be leading our politics. Our time in God's word is supposed to be forming our political opinions. Instead, what's often happening today is the other way around. Politics and our views there are actually leading our faith. We allow our political opinions, we, we take those and then we allow it to shape our theology. We allow the moral views of our party to tell us what's right and wrong. We go to the Bible to prove our political stances instead of to give God space to change them. Have you noticed this? This is the norm today. But really it should look as weird, and it does look as weird to the world as me wearing the collar and my dog leading me around on the leash. So the question is, will you reevaluate your political stances through the lens of our faith Or will you warp our faith to support your political stances? Can't do both. We know we've given the crown of our life over to politics when we're on the wrong side of the leash. We can also know that we've done this when we're more excited to talk about faith, or more excited to talk about politics than to talk about faith. Listen to Paul on how pumped up he was to tell people about his faith, to testify to his faith. He said this in Acts 20, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Like, that's the passion I want to have. I don't have that every day. Wouldn't you want that type of passion where you're saying my only aim of life, I'd give anything in life, my only aim, my only passion in life is to testify, to tell the story of of my faith to other people? Like, man, I want that that passion that he had. And that kind of passion just has a huge effect on the world around us. People notice, don't they? I mean, I'm really passionate about cookies. Some of you think, yeah, that's pretty obvious. You didn't have to say that. But like, I am passionate about cookies. I found a really good chocolate chip cookie recipe. I can tell you all about it after the service. Pretty pumped up about it, okay? It's delicious. But if I tell you that story, and I'm passionate about that story, you're going to want one of those cookies. You're going to be interested and excited, too. The same thing happens with us in our faith or politics. What you choose to talk about with your friends and be passionate about in conversations, whether that's online or in person, that is what they're going to find passion in, too. That is what they're going to think you value. They're, that's what they're going to want to emulate, just like you're going to want to go home and make these cookies if I tell you about them more, okay? 
it's the same thing. Many of us are much more evangelistic in our politics than our faith. And people notice. They're not clueless, right? They're watching our lives. We know we've given the crown of our life to politics if we're more excited to talk about politics than faith. Okay, fifth, we've given politics our crown if we disrespect the leaders of the other side. Romans 13, one to two tells us, and before I read this, know that this is one of the ones I struggle with. Just gonna be honest, okay? Romans tells us, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Subject yourself to the governing authorities. At base minimum, be respectful of them. Now, this doesn't mean you don't call out evil and injustice when it's there. It means that you do it with respect. There has to be a respect. There has to be a submission to those governing authorities. Now, I know what's going through most of our minds. It's like, oh, but that person, they're really, right? Okay, remember that when Paul is writing this, he's writing this about governing authorities that are trying to kill him, okay? So that kind of makes us think, well, our excuses might not work, right? So years ago, as a pastor, in a larger church, and so we had this huge church board, and we had these really long meetings that I didn't like every month. Uh, that's just me complaining. It has nothing to do with the story. And so I was walking into a church board meeting, and these are the people that are, like, leading the church, right? I'm walking into this church board meeting one night, and one of my friends, she comes up, and, and we're walking in together, and it was four years ago, like this month. So it was right before the election happened, and everyone's all pumped up about it. Uh, and so we're walking in, and she says, if that Trump guy wins, well, he's not my president. He's a, you can fill in the blank with things I can't say from the stage, right? <laughs> and so I go through this, like, three, four-hour meeting. I'm so bored, and it gets over, and I'm walking out of the hall, and I walk by two guys. And they're sitting there, they're talking about politics, and uh, as I walk past them, one grabs me to talk about something else, and the other one says, Obama's never been my president. He's a, and insert things I can't say from the stage, right? And I'll never forget that because it was the same night, same church, the same board, and people disrespecting and saying awful, awful things about the authorities on the other side, right? And, but this has become the norm, right? This has just become the norm for us. And, it, and honestly, it's hard for me too. It is. This, is. this one is a struggle for me. But our disrespect reveals whether we value God's command or our political complaints more. And we know who's wearing the crown in our life. Well, if we disrespect the leaders of the other side, it should tell us maybe politics has started to wear our crown. And sixth, if God happens to have all of the same political opinions as your political party, you might know that your politics are wearing the crown in your life. You know, one of the, the most consistent uh, uh, commands in all of Scripture is like in Exodus 34, 17. Do not make any idols. This means not just don't carve a statue that's an idol. This means don't put anything above God. Don't worship any, anything over God. Don't give anything the power and authority of your life over God. He is your God. You make no idols. You make no idols. Here's the funny thing about idols, though. Years ago, I had a friend uh, who was Hindu, and he had, the, when he walked into his house, right over in the corner, there was a little idol, this little silver statue thing. I wish I knew the name of it, but I, but I don't. And the first few times I just looked at it, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And about the third or fourth time I went into his house, I went over to get a closer look. And you know what the interesting thing about it was that the face of the statue looked almost identical to my friend. Almost identical. And historically, this is what we tend to do with idols. When people go to create their own gods, to carve their own statues of what they think God is like, that God always happens to be a reflection of who they are. It always just happens to look just like them. And this is what we're doing today with our politics. For many people, the God they believe in is little more than a reflection of their political party. It just so happens, it just so happens that the God that they've carved looks just like their political ideology. This is why Christians should be very hesitant to be a part of a political party. 
once we marry ourselves to an ideology, that ideology, it begins to carve an idol in our mind over time. Our ideology then becomes idolatry. We carve, carve idols in the shapes of a donkey and an elephant, and then we, we use that idol as like a divine stamp to prove we're right about our political views. So if God, if he happens to have, if your view of God, what you think of God, happens to just agree with pretty much everything your political party, your political leaning believes, then you might not be worshiping God. You might be worshiping an idol. We know we've given the crown of our life to politics if God has the same political opinions as our party or our leaning. So how about you? Who wears your crown? I know a couple of these I struggle with. I'll just, that's, I, I struggle with at least two or three of these, okay? But who wears your crown? Who wears your crown? Ultimately, only Jesus deserves our, our unconditional loyalty. Only Jesus, not a system, not a government, not a party, not a politician, only Jesus deserves that unconditional loyalty. Only Jesus gets to wear our crown. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, I hope we have not given the authority of our lives over to a political party or, or because the, the thing about that is that kingdoms of this world are always gonna be in disagreement and tension with the kingdom of God. And we have to be able to even question and call out the injustice and the evil in our own political leanings, in our own party, in our own ways of thinking. Only Jesus wears our crown. Jesus did not come to take sides in the great American political debate. He is not a Republican. Jesus is not a Democrat. He is not an independent. He does not exist to take your sides. Jesus did not come to take sides. He came to take over. Jesus wears our crown. And one day, one day, your, your politician won't be in power. One day, your political party or whichever way you lean, it will dissolve into the history books. One day, this nation will no longer be a nation but Jesus will still be on the throne and Jesus will still be king and Jesus will still wear the crown. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that even in, even in just parts of life like this that are so hard to wade through, that compete for our time and attention, our hearts and our passions and our worship, we pray that your truth would just break in we, we pray that your truth would just, just break into our hearts and minds and begin to transform us into what you want us to believe, how you want us to engage in this thing, how you want us to treat others. And Lord, we do pray in the months ahead. I, I pray for everybody here, everybody watching online, Lord, that as we, we have conversations about politics and as we read things, as we, we interact with this, Lord, that more than, than proving a point, more than a certain side, my prayer is that people would know that you're wearing our crown, that people could tell by the way we interact with this thing that you're in charge, that you have power over our lives. And I pray that that would just be so attractive to others that they'd wanna know why. We love you, just name I pray.